Now, last week, we studied the fifth seal. And if you remember, the fifth seal explains why God is showing restraint during the tribulation period. In other words, it explains why God's judgment upon the earth is being drawn out over a seven-year period. It's because God's desire is for all men to be saved. Therefore, he's declared that the gospel must be preached unto all the nations before Jesus Christ returns. In fact, that is a prerequisite to the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you ever heard the term advent? Some of you have. Maybe you went to an Adventist church or something like that. Well, the word advent means coming. So when we talk about the second advent of Jesus Christ, we're talking about the second coming. Now, contrary to what most of you have been taught, preaching the gospel to all the nations is not a prerequisite to the rapture. It's a prerequisite to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is a totally different event than the rapture. If you remember, when the rapture occurs, Jesus comes back, but not all the way to earth. He actually stops in the clouds. And the dead are raised to be rejoined with their souls. And those who are alive are caught up to be with him. Where? In the air. So keep in mind that the rapture is a totally different event than the second advent of Jesus Christ. And you need to remember that. So before Jesus Christ returns to this earth and he puts his two feet upon the ground, the gospel must be preached to all the nations. Which tells us that the gospel is going to be preached during the tribulation. But preaching the gospel during the tribulation is going to prove very costly. Because those who preach the gospel and those who receive the gospel will in all probability be martyred. And because the dispensation of grace will end when the church age ends and the dispensation of judgment will begin when the tribulation starts, those that are martyred during the tribulation are going to cry out for vengeance. Look at verse number 10 in chapter 6. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? But they're told to have patience. Because the end won't come until the gospel's been preached unto all the nations. And the very last martyr has given his life for the gospel's sake. So they're told to be patient. Because it's not time for the end to come. But hang on, the end is coming. And it's coming very soon, which takes us to the sixth seal. You see, the sixth seal is meant to provide assurance that the end is coming and that it's coming very soon. It's also meant to act as a warning to all those upon the earth, a warning that the end is near and that they better repent. So let's look at the sixth seal. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Let's read verses 12 through 17. And verse 17 is the last verse in chapter 6. It says, And I beheld... When he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell upon the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Now, let me ask you a question. If you saw all these things happening today, what would you think? You probably think that the world was coming to an end. And that's the purpose of the sixth seal. To warn, warn those that are living upon the earth that the world is coming to an end. This is a warning that God is getting ready to bring an end to the sinful world. And he is going to set up his kingdom upon the earth. But this is not the end. It's just a warning that the end is coming. So you need to repent. In fact, we're just about 21 months into the tribulation. Halfway into the first half of the tribulation. Remember, the tribulation is going to last for seven years. It's divided into two sections. The first half of the 70th week, which is that seven-year period, and the second half. So you actually have 42 months. We're about 21 months into the first half of 
the tribulation. But when those on the earth see these things happening, they're going to think that the end of the world has come. In fact, they're going to wish it was, but it won't be. So let's look at what happens when the sixth seal is open. Turn to Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, and let's take this verse by verse. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So the sixth seal starts with a great earthquake. I want you to underline that phrase in your Bible, great earthquake. That phrase is translated from the Greek words, megas seismos, which literally translates to huge earthquake, enormous earthquake. In fact, our English word mega is transliterated from this Greek word megas, and it means huge or enormous, giant in scope. And our English word seismo, which means earthquake, is transliterated from this Greek word seismos. So this is a mega earthquake. It is an enormous earthquake, bigger than the earth has ever seen. It's going to be so big that it's going to cause a polar axis shift, which I'm going to explain in detail tonight, but not right now, in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself, all right? This earthquake is going to be so big that it's going to be felt around the world. It'll go off the charts on the Richter scale. How many of you remember in, in 2000, well, the tsunami that hit Sri Lanka? That was a 9 on the Richter scale. That's not even close to what this mega earthquake is going to be. This is going to go off the charts of the Richter scale. The tectonic plates will move, triggering more earthquakes and causing volcanoes to erupt and activating previously dormant volcanoes. These volcanoes are going to spew vast quantities of ash, dust, steam, and gases into the sky, causing the sun to be darkened and the moon to appear blood red. Now, how do I know all this? Because we've seen these volcanoes do this in the past, and when it happens, guess what takes place? The sun becomes black and the moon turns blood red. But this is just the beginning. Look at verse number 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Now, the word stars is translated from the Greek word aster. Our English word asteroid is derived from this word. In fact, did you know that asteroids are the source of most meteorites? It's true. So asteroids and meteorites are going to start falling upon the earth just like fruit falls off a tree in a very heavy wind. So I want you to picture what's happening, what John is seeing in this revelation. A huge earthquake occurs, an earthquake that's never been seen like this on the earth. It causes the tectonic plates to move, which triggers more earthquakes along all the faults, which causes volcanoes to erupt, which will cause the sun to become dark, and the moon to turn red. But that's not enough. Then you have these huge meteorites falling on the earth. Wiping out cities and causing catastrophic damage and destruction to the earth. But people, that's not the worst of it. Now, if that's all the sixth seal was, you would say, man, what more do you need? But that's not the worst of it. This catastrophic event is going to cause a polar axis shift. Now, does everyone know what a polar axis shift is? I'm going to assume that there's some people here that don't know what a polar axis shift is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and explain it. I'm going to give you a little bit of a science lesson, if you don't mind. The Earth is like a gyroscope spinning on an axis. The axis that it's spinning on is called the polar axis because it's in line with the north and the south pole. In other words, think of it as an axis. Think of the axis as an imaginary line that extends all the way through the earth and comes out the North Pole and the South Pole. And that's what the earth is spinning on. So we've got our globe here. Now, we all know that the earth spins, right? It's spinning on this axis. This is the axis. You have one here at the South Pole and one here at the North Pole. Now, pretend that that line would go all the way through, and that's the axis that the Earth is spinning on. Now, what's interesting, and I'm going to mention this quite frequently because it's pretty important. This axis, this polar axis, because it goes to the North and South Pole, this North 
Po axis is actually pointing directly toward Polaris, the North Star. And the Earth is tilted at 23.5 degrees. Now, because the Earth is tilted 23 point degrees on its axis as it rotates around the sun, we have different seasons throughout the year. As the Earth revolves around the sun, the northern and the southern hemispheres either move further or closer away, or further away from the sun or closer to the sun. And let me ex just kind of illustrate this, if you don't mind, with this globe. All right? This is tilted. Let's say this is the sun right here. My pulpit is the sun. Right here is North America. Can you see that? Can everyone see North America? Okay, because we're tilted at 23.5 degrees, when this begins to rotate across it, at this point, I want you to notice that North America is close to the sun. Now, as we start to go, the globe, not the globe, the earth does not do this. Why does it not do that? This. Because that would mean that the axis is rotating and it doesn't do that. I told you that the polar axis points directly towards the North Star, right? It's always pointing towards the North Star. So it doesn't do this. It actually continues to stay just like this as it revolves around the sun. Now when it gets on this side, it's further away from the sun. What does that tell us? It's winter time. That's right. Over here, it's closer to the sun. That means it's summertime. But as it begins to come and gets around here, it's a little further away. We start experiencing autumn or fall. Then we get over here, and we're the furthest away from the sun. So now we're experiencing winter. And as we start to go back around, as we're revolving around, we hit springtime, and then we come all the way to summer. So that's how we get the seasons. Does that make sense? Now, the polar axis of the earth, as I've already told you, is pointed towards the North Star. And it continues to point towards the North Star as it revolves around the sun. If it didn't do that, we wouldn't have different seasons. But that's what it does. And that's why we can study the stars. They're always fixed in this place. We know exactly where they're going to be. Now, how many of you remember the tsunami that hit Sri Lanka on December 26, 2004? Do you remember that? It was caused by a massive earthquake that measured a 9, as I just got through telling you, on the Richter scale. It killed 170,000 people in Sumatra, 31,000 in Sri Lanka. What's interesting is that the earthquake that triggered this tsunami was said to have caused the earth to wobble. Not enough to feel, but enough to measure. Now, when I say wobble... What I'm talking about is the polar axis moving from its tilt of 23.5 degrees. And that's what a polar, polar axis shift is. It's always at 23.5 degrees. But when that hit, that tsunami, that earthquake that caused the tsunami, it caused this to wobble a little bit. Not enough for you to feel but in other words, that 23.5 degrees was just kind of going back and forth. And that's what a polar axis shift is. It's when the polar axis shifts. And the earth is either tilted more than 23.5 degrees or less than 23.5 degrees. Now, can you imagine what that would do if the polar axis shifted dramatically? It would create... Such a climate change that would cause catastrophic events. It would figuratively, not literally, figuratively turn the world upside down. We'll look at that in just a minute. Now, how do I know that a polar axis shift is going to occur when this great earthquake hits? Aren't you trying to sensationalize this out? You know, you're, you're teaching the book of Revelation. You've been going verse by verse. And you wrote this chart up here. And you came to the sixth seal. And you said there's going to be a polar axis shift. Are you just trying to sensationalize it? Are you going to be an evangelist and embellish it and make it worse than it sounds so you can get more people saved? No. So how do I know that a polar axis shift is going to occur when this sixth seal is open and this great earthquake occurs. Well, verse 14 tells me. Turn to verse number 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll, 
when it's rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Now here's what's kind of sad. This is a horrible translation. Because it's a horrible translation, most of you don't understand what it's saying. It doesn't even make sense. I mean, look at that. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled away. The heavens departed as a scroll when it's rolled away. What does that mean? The heavens aren't going to be there anymore? There's nothing out there? No, no, no. This is a horrible translation, as I said. So what I want to do is I want to show you how it should have been translated. So let's just kind of tear this apart, all right? First of all, the word departed is translated from the Greek word apokorizo, and it means to split or to part. So what John's saying is that the heaven was split like a scroll. So I want you to picture heaven as a split scroll. Now, this is a split scroll. Do you know why it's called a split scroll? Because it's split right down the middle. Now, if it was like this, that's a scroll. All right? But it says that heaven is like a split scroll. This is a split scroll because it is split in two. Does that make sense? And in John's day, this was referred to as a split scroll. Now, I want you to underline the phrase, rolled together. That phrase is translated from the Greek word, hyliso. Hyliso simply means to roll. The picture that John is painting is of a split scroll being rolled. Not rolled up, not rolled out. Not rolled together, but simply being rolled. Something that John would have seen every day of his life. What does it mean it's being rolled? What it means is that when it's opened, when you roll a split scroll, as you roll the right side out, you roll the left side in to read. When you say, I didn't quite get that. I wasn't paying attention. Hey, you had that TV up too loud. Could you turn that down? I'm going to have to read this again. So I would roll the left side out as I roll the left side in. That's how you roll a split scroll. Does that make sense? All right. Now, let's illustrate what John is saying here. He said that heaven, the sky, was parted like a scroll and rolled. Now, typically, whenever a scroll was rolled... You rode, as I said, one side out, one side in. Can you see me doing that? It's kind of hard not having a table to do that. That's going out while that's going in. That's how you rolled a scroll. So that means that the stars were visible wherever you lived are no longer visible. Or you have to look somewhere for them. Because what he's saying is the sky was like this split scroll. And... It rolled. In other words, this side went out as this side went in. Which meant that the things that I saw on the scroll, the things that I was able to see, I can no longer see. And the things that were hidden from me, I can now see. That's the purpose of rolling a scroll. Wow. So if a word was in the middle of this scroll, it moves to the left as I roll the scroll. Everything shifts as the scroll is rolled. Does that make sense? If I'm sitting here reading it and I see a word that's right here and I want to roll this scroll, as I roll it, right now it's in the middle, but as I roll it, now it's on the left side. That's what he's telling us happened. Now, when he begins to describe the sky like this, and he says it was like a split scroll, and the scroll was rolled, what he's saying is that the stars that were visible before, wherever you lived, are no longer visible. Or they're no longer visible in the position they used to be. You have to look somewhere else to see them. Because the sky has rolled like a scroll. And the stars that weren't vis visible before are now visible. Why? Because the sky's been rolled. Now, let me ask you a question. What would make the sky roll like a scroll. Only one thing. A polar axis shift. That's the only thing that can explain the sky looking like a parted scroll that is now being rolled. 
In other words, what you once saw, you can no longer see. And what you couldn't see, you can now see. Still don't believe it? Look in the last part of verse number. Well, in fact, let me go before I say that. Think about it like this. On a polar axis shift, this polar axis, the north, this, this north pole is pointing straight towards the north star. That means that if I go out to actually see the stars at night, I can actually be able to see all the different constellations. But in order to see these constellations, I have to look for that one star that I know exactly where it is and what star is that, the north star. So what I can do is I can take this little star map. Let me just kind of explain how the star map works. It tells you, or it has all the months, and this is the North Star right here in the middle. This is kind of the axis that everything goes on. And I would roll to November the 5th, about 7.35. And then what I would do, because it has north here, is I'm going to turn this north. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the North Star. And I, I would put that where the North Star is, and I can see all the different constellations. Now, what he's telling me, what John is describing is that the sky is like a split scroll. And this split scroll all of a sudden rolled. In other words, all of these constellations for thousands of years, I've been able to look up there and say, that's the North Star. And at this time of the year, at this particular time at night, I'm able to see all these constellations. But all of a sudden, because of this occurrence, the sky has done, done something dramatic. All of a sudden, this thing has rolled on me, and now what I used to see is no longer there. Why? Because... The North Star, this is no longer pointing at the North Star. The North Star hasn't moved. The constellations haven't moved. Guess what's taking place? The polar axis has shifted. And as a result of it having shifted, it's just like a scroll. And it's everything that's always been up there. And it's in the same perspective to all of that. And, and, and in the same uh, respects to it. It's now just rolled over. But it's not where it's supposed to be. That is what John is describing. So I asked you the question, what would make the sky seem to roll like a scroll? And it is this polar axis shift. That's the only thing that can explain the sky looking like a parted scroll that's being rolled. And all of a sudden, all these constellations that we look up here, all of a sudden, they're over here. And some of the things I used to see, I can't see because it's rolled over. And some of the things used to we couldn't see is rolled out. Oh my gosh. Now if you still don't believe it, look at the last part of verse number 14. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now the word moved, kineo, can mean to move or it can mean to remove. But it really doesn't matter. Because either way, it describes the effect of a polar axis shift. When the earth's axis shifts... Most islands are going to be completely wiped away. They're going to be covered by water. And the ones that aren't will seem like they've moved. Why? Because those in the tropics will feel like they're in the Arctic Circle. And those that are in the Arctic Circle will become tropical islands. As if they were moved from one location to another. All of a sudden... These things that were so close, that equator that's so close to there, if this begins to shift, it's going to shift either this way or it's going to shift straight up and down. But actually, we're going to dig a little deeper and we're going to find out it's going to fall more this way. Maybe you want to go to South America if you miss the rapture. We'll see why in just a minute. All right? Now, when the sixth seal is opened and the polar axis shift occurs... It's going to fulfill two prophecies in the book of Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 34, verse number 4. Because Isaiah saw the very same thing that John saw. It says, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Isaiah is talking about the end of the world. He's talking about that period of time that God's judgment comes right before Jesus Christ returns. And he's seeing the same thing that John does. Now again, this is not a good translation. 
I'm going to tear it apart and show you what it really says. I want you to underline the word dissolved. Dissolved is translated from the Hebrew word makak. And it means actually to decay. To rot. To become putrid. Now, whenever something starts to decay, that means that its cells are breaking down. So it's no longer stable. Did you know that? And that's what Isaiah is saying. The host of heaven, the stars, are decaying. What does he mean decaying? He means that the stars in heaven are no longer stable. They no longer are holding their position. Oh my gosh. Why? Well, he tells us why. He says because the heavens are being rolled together like a scroll. Which isn't a good translation. Underline the phrase, rolled together. That phrase is translated from the Hebrew word, galal. It simply means to roll. Guess how it should have been translated if you did it literally. And the heaven shall be rolled as a scroll. That's the very same thing that John saw in his revelation in the book of Revelation. The stars are not out of place. They're not. They seem to be out of place. Why? Because not that they moved, but because that the earth's polar axis has shifted. And it's no longer pointing towards the north star. And because the polar axis is no longer pointing towards the north star, it's as if all of the sky has been rolled it shifted it has rolled over and it's out of position and when isaiah sees this in his vision he describes it the only way he can the heavens decaying they're not stable they're not holding their position they have moved now the only thing that can make these stars move because they're not moving but it looks like they're not holding their position is that the earth's polar axis has shifted. Now I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 24 verse number 20. It says the earth staggers like a drunk. It trembles like a tent in a storm. It falls and it will not rise again. For the guilt of its rebellion is very heavy. Now you need to understand something about the prophets. They're going to look at the cause of this as being what? Man's sin. You see, they see everything from a spiritual perspective. The reason this is happening, according to Isaiah, is because of the sins of the world. It's just built up to the transgression. And that's really the way it, what's causing it. Had Adam not sinned, we would be in a perfect world. You wouldn't have any of the consequences of sin. But because of the sin, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. It's amazing to me that California actually has to try and change their constitution to say that a marriage is only to be between one man and one woman. But that's where America is, people. That's where it's come to. And it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And so Isaiah, he actually sees the root cause of this being spiritual. But what happens is he sees this earth, and it's staggering like a drunk man. In fact, can you go back on that? Go back and look at that scripture because I want them to be able to see it. Just hit your backspace key. Can you not do that? Yeah. The earth staggers like a drunk. In other words, it begins to wobble. Not just like what happened when that tsunami hit Sri Lanka. We're talking about really wobbling. And then it says it trembles like a tent in a storm. How many of you have been in a tent in a storm? And that thing's just moving like this. And then it says, it falls and will not rise again. Now, because it's tilted at 23 and a half degrees, this is just what I think. I'm not putting this in. It doesn't say it stands upright. It says it falls. That's why I think it's going to go that way. More than 23 and a half degrees. Now, the great earthquake, volcanoes erupting, and meteorites hitting the earth will cause the earth to stagger just like a drunk, and then it will fall. The polar axis will shift. 
the polar axis is no longer going to be pointed towards the North Star and the Earth will no longer be tilted 23.5 degrees. Now, if you were on the Earth when this occurred, what would you think? I mean, all of a sudden, you've got this ice age at certain places, and other places are tropical, and, and, and certain things literally are frozen, kind of like it was in the ice age. What would you think? You would think that this is the end of the world. You would be scared to death. You would run from the cities to hide in the hills because these meteorites are falling out of the sky. You're seeing this temperature change. Uh, we're going to find out later that huge chunks of hell. How many of you saw the movie um, The Day After? Big old chunks of ice. We're getting there, people. It's coming. You'd run from the cities to hide in the hills. And what you would be thinking is that God's judgment has finally come upon the earth. And people, that's exactly what happens. Look at verse 15 and 16 back in Revelation chapter 6. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. I want you to notice that everyone acts this way. Man, it's just not the poor, the middle class. It's everyone. We're talking kings are going to be hiding. They have no place safe to go. Man, they're flying out of the White House. They're getting out. They don't know where this is going to come. They are going to the only place that they think is safe. Even though mountains are moving and islands are coming, the only thing they can think is if we can get into a cave, if we can get into a den, we might be safe. So everyone runs to the mountains. And because of fear of what's going to come next, they want to die. That's how scared they are. They're scared to death. But people, this is not the end. This is just the sixth seal. And when they finally realize that this is not the end, they harden their hearts like Pharaoh did in Egypt. So instead of repenting and accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they harden their heart with the exception of a few. Some are saved, but very few. Now, why has God done this? Why would God do this? Why are his judgments getting more and more Severe. Man, we thought it was bad. Let's think about this. When the red horse came on the scene, we thought it was bad. Right? And then the third horseman came, which was famine. Man, it's really getting bad. But it hasn't touched the rich yet. And then we see death come on the scene. And one billion people die, and you think, can't get much worse than this. It's bad. But you know, men, we can get through this. This is just the way it is. It's been this way all the time. And then all of a sudden, wham. An earthquake happens that shakes the entire world. The tectonic plates begin to move, which triggers all of the earthquakes along the faults. Volcanoes begin to erupt. And if that's not bad enough, all of a sudden the meteorites begin to hit it. And when all this begins to happen, the earth begins to wobble. Oh my gosh. And John looks up into the sky and he says, The sky parted like a scroll and it rolled. In other words, all of the sudden... Where we were looking, the sky just seemed to go whoop, and it was over here. And the mountains and the islands were moved and removed, which tells us this is a polar axis shift. Now, when we begin to look at this, these judgments keep getting more and more severe. Why? It's because those that are left on the earth did not receive Jesus Christ during this dispensation of grace. So now he's going to bring judgment in the hope that they're going to repent before the final judgment. My dad used to have a little saying when we wouldn't listen to him. My dad would tell us to do something and when we didn't do it, my dad would say this. Those who don't hear must feel. <laughs> now, when my dad said, those who don't hear must feel, we stopped what we were doing and we listened. Why? Because what my dad was saying is, if you don't listen to me and do what I say, I'm going to spank you. But the purpose of spanking was to cause us to change, to repent. Now, those on the earth during the tribulation refused to repent. They refused to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Therefore, they missed the rapture. 
That dispensation of grace is gone, but God still wants people to be saved. So now God's bringing judgment upon them because those who can hear the gospel must what? Feel. So God's bringing judgment upon the world. But his goal is for them to repent. He still wants the gospel to be preached unto all the nations. Now, once the sixth seal is opened and this polar axis shift occurs, the big question is this. Oh my gosh, we're only 21 months into this thing. Who in the world is going to be able to survive the tribulation? Look at verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? In other words, now that the tribulation has begun, who's going to be able to live through it? Good question. As I've already said, by the end of the fourth seal, over a billion people have died. No telling how many people have died when the sixth seal was opened. Now here's what's interesting. We're going to have an interlude in chapter 7. That means that chapter 7 is not in chronological order. The question is asked at the end of chapter 6. Who shall survive this thing? We're going to find out. God answers the question. The 144,000 sealed are going to survive. Why? At least for a time. Why? Because God wants the gospel to be preached unto all the nations. So why in the world as we're reading through the book of Revelation and we see all these horrible things happen and we think, why would God do this? I'll tell you why. Because God is a good God and he's loving and he's kind. And he's not just going to lop it off at the end of the dispensation of grace and say, now the final judgment's coming. No, these people wouldn't hear, so now they have to feel. Even in the judgments, his heart goes out and he says, repent. All you have to do is repent. Repent. All you have to do is repent. But their hearts grow harder and harder and harder until we're going to finally get to the battle of Armageddon. And they know who they're fighting. And they're coming against the city of Jerusalem with such a staunch heart against God. And then Jesus returns. Had they only repented, I want you to see the goodness of God because some of you always wonder, well, why is God doing this? Because God loves you. But if you're listening, if you're here, you won't have to feel. If you'll hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and receive it, you won't have to experience this. That's why at the end of every sermon, I always give an opportunity for people to accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior because God's will is for you to be saved.